Good morning and welcome to But Who Takes Care of You, the third program designed especially for caregivers dealing with dementia. I'm Eileen Wolf. My late husband George, along with his siblings, founded Wolf Caregivers for the memory of their parents, Sam and Nina Wolf. Sam was a past president of Jewish Family Services and at the time of Nina's diagnosis, was unable to find the help that he needed. We didn't know how to handle Nina's resistance. We didn't know how bad things were gonna get. We felt helpless. Friends of theirs stopped spending time with them. They were starting to feel isolated. We were embarrassed to be with Nina in public and then felt guilty that we were embarrassed. Through our process, we recognized a void in the market for spouses and adult children dealing with this horrible illness. Wolf Caregivers provides support for those dealing with dementia and the resources they need, providing practical and emotional support for people caring for their loved one. These services include family consultations and counseling, support groups for adult children and spouses, educational workshops, financial support for temporary home health aides, and seminars. Topics covered include coping strategies, long distance caregiving strategies, care options, home safety, and end of life comfort and care. I was there, I've walked in your shoes. I know the devastating effects that dementia has on a family, but I want you to know that Wolf Caregivers is a place of understanding and enlightenment. And today's about you and the importance of taking care of your own health and personal needs. It's about a positive attitude and resilience. A program like this doesn't just happen. Please help me thank Susan Greenbaum, JFCS CEO, Deborah Glazer, JFCS Director of Marketing, Michelle Willikoff, JFCS Director of Development, Cheryl Sarnak, JFCS Board Member and Chair of today's event, Helen Graff and Diane Seiden, Board Members, Leslie Greenberg, Senior Source, Deborah Schwartz, Committee and Graphic Artist. And now I'd like to introduce you to Susan Greenbaum, CEO of JFCS. Thank you so much, Eileen. Um, and thank you for um, everything that Wolf Caregiver does for the community. We're uh, very grateful. I am just delighted to see all of you here today. Thank you all for coming. I know it's not easy on a Sunday morning, and I know it's not easy to do things for ourselves. So I'm so happy to see all of you, and I'm absolutely delighted to be at the JCC and to uh, co-sponsor this event with the JCC on the Palisades. It's like coming home for me. Um, and now I have the awesome task of introducing our guest speaker. Um, Dr. Maria Sirwa is an inspirational speaker, consultant, and licensed psychologist who has worked in the fields of wellness and positive psychology for 20 years. As a positive psychologist, she focuses on the resilience of the human spirit, particularly when under chronic stress. Maria brings a depth of experience in personal and leadership development focused on building resilience, leveraging optimism, and strengthening capacity within families and organizations. Her clinical work brings the bounty of positive psychology and mind-body medicine to families and children facing terminal illness and to the staff who care for them. Trained at the New England Deaconess Mind Body Clinic in Boston and at the Dana Farber Cancer Institute in Boston, she currently works as a consultant to families and the staff, the psychology staffs and hospital and hospice staffs in that community. She received her doctorate from the Massachusetts School of Professional Psychology in 1993. An author as well, Maria has published two works, A Short Course in Happiness, after loss and other dark, difficult times. And Every Day Counts, 
Lessons in Love, Faith, and Resilience from Children Facing Illness. Maria lives in the Berkshires with her partner, Herb. She loves to write, dance, and hike. And um, she does her very best to feed her cat every day. I hope the cat is doing well. Please welcome Maria. It's a little bit of a maze. <laughs> So I'm ambivalent about my cat. Has anybody ever had a pet that they're ambivalent about? Yes. It's not my cat, it's my son's cat. It's the 11th cat I've had to take care of in my life. I'm a little done with the cat thing. And she is, I have to say, amazingly self-sufficient. So I tend not to feed her every day. Um, but lately I've taken it on as a kind of ritual that I'll feed her, I'll go down to the basement and feed. It's a very nice basement. I'll go down to the basement and feed her, and then I'll take four minutes for myself for meditation. Uh, so I've learned to tie a ritual, feeding her, to a way to take care of myself. And that's one of the things that we'll talk about this morning. But before I go any further, thank you, Eileen. Thank you to the Wolf family. Thank you to the JCC. And to where's Cheryl? Hi, Cheryl, who, who at first invited me here. Such an honor. Years and years ago, um, a rabbi wrote that we ought to walk around in life with a piece of paper in each pocket. And in one pocket is a, on the piece of paper ought be written, you are nothing but dust and ashes. You know, like nobody's special, we're all the same, we're all gonna end up in the same way, right? And yet in the other pocket ought be written, for you this world was created. Everyone is special. We are all particular, unique, astonishing, singular creations. And that one of the tricks in life is to figure out which piece of paper to pull out at any one time. Well, on the journey of caregiving, often, we forget to pull out that piece of paper that reminds us that we are special and that the world, in fact, has been created for us because we are so busy loving and caring and nurturing someone else, yes? And so that balance often of I matter and others matter as well becomes skewed. And our conversation this morning is based on the science of positive psychology, but it really is about sort of coming into better balance around who matters, right? Because reality, we, we all matter, right? Those we care for professionally, those we adore and care for from our hearts, and we matter as well. So. I'm going to introduce to you some principles from positive psychology. Positive psychology is the study of who we are at our best. It's a subspecialty in psychology that sort of blew up about 25 years ago. It's a very rigorously um, scienced uh, specialty. So we'll have some perspective and also some practical tools that you'll be leaving with today. Um, so it's not just theory, but you know, there'll be a number of moments along the way where we'll, we'll do some conversation and plenty of time for questions. Fair enough? and eat at any point, <laughs> at any point eat. Um, so just do me a favor, here's a little quick past psych intervention right away. I'd like you to just catch someone's eye across the room, not at your table, but across the room and, and do this like, aloha, go. <laughs> just wave to somebody, okay, with a little fervor, aloha. aloha. Okay, now catch someone else across the room, bonjour. <laughs> okay, and now someone at the, your table, ciao, ciao. Okay. That was seven seconds, just about six and a half seconds. One of the things that we've come to understand is that those of us who are resilient in life actually build in my, what we call micro moments of positivity. Micro moments of positivity. Because often in the position of caregiving, there isn't a tremendous amount of spaciousness in our time. Is that fair? Yeah, there's not a lot of room for, I'm gonna do an hour and a half yoga, and I'll meditate later, and I'll take an art class, and I'll do a sip thing later at night, you know? Often our days are not like that. So these micro moments of positivity are crucial. I'd like you to think of the micro moments as a bit of golden lacquer on a broken bowl. Ooh, how's that? It's okay? You guys okay over here? 
This is a bowl that has been broken and repaired with golden lacquer. It's an art form that emerged in Japan in the 15th century. A shogun by the name of Yoshimasa had a family heirloom bowl shatter, sent the bowl to China for repair, which was the custom at the time, and the bowl came back repaired with these ugly metal staples. And the shogun was so despairing over the loss of the fineness of the bowl that he challenged the artisans in his community to come up with a more beautiful form of repair. And one of them returned a fractured bowl, now lined in the broken pieces with golden lacquer. The art form kintsukuri or kintsukurai, um, kintsugi, became so popular that it became a philosophy. And the philosophy is that even as we are fractured, our intent, our purpose, our singularity, our meaning remains whole, right? Even as we are a little fractured, a little flawed, a little vulnerable, maybe a little nutty. Can we just say, like everybody's a little tiny bit nutty, yes? yes? Even as we are that imperfect, we are also whole. And that's the metaphor of resilience I'd love for you to hold on to. The old metaphor from the 80s was that those of us who were resilient were like the willow tree that could bend in the storm. Remember that metaphor? Or you were broken. It was one or the other. And it turns out that's not true at all. Most of us live in this paradoxical place where we're fractured and exhausted and stressed and strained and guilty and a little sort of pissy and irritable. Can I say pissy at the JCC? <laughs> pissy and irritable. We're that, and we are incredible at the same time. So the first teaching I'd like to offer you is this notion of paradox, the ability to hold both at the same time. Fair enough? Fair enough. This is Rachel Naomi Remen. I don't know why her name got switched around in her quote, but the expectation that we can be immersed in suffering in the presence of caregiving, for example, and not be touched by it is as unrealistic as being in the, able to walk through water without getting wet. The very care of caregiving, the very job of caregiving, necessarily changes our experience of living. It, it, it brings forward feelings of regret sometimes or sorrow, deep compassion and love also fatigue and worry, right? All of this is happening. It's like the water, the temperature of the water, the feeling of the water begins to change. And it becomes the life that we are living. So what could help us move toward a place of actually caring for ourselves just a little bit more? So that balance of caring for other, caring for ourself is a little bit more in balance. So the first pause psych sort of practice I'd like to give to you is this notion of permission to be human. Permission to be human is a teaching that comes from a um, world thought leader in our field, Tal Ben Shahar, who's from Israel. Tal won the um, national squash championship when he was a young man in Israel and decided that was his future, right? He was going to be a professional athlete, got himself to England to train with the top professional squash maestro, if you will. And because Tal was um, a perfectionist, he overtrained. He didn't let himself off the hook. He trained so hard and so often and so frequently that he actually destroyed his back and was told that if he didn't give up squash, he wouldn't be able to walk again. So within the space of a few years, he went from national champion to never being able to play squash again because he had a mindset that forced him to always be striving. So let me just check in. Has anybody in the room ever felt like you needed to be perfect at what you were doing in terms of caregiving? We'll have a recovering perfectionist support group later, right? Yes. yes. Right. Have any of you felt ever felt like other people are doing this much better than you are? Yeah. Has anyone ever gone to bed at night feeling like no matter what you do, it just hasn't been enough? Yeah. Those are normal, natural human responses to the need to care give. And what Tao figured out along the way is that in order to facilitate a life in which 
we do, it's okay. It's okay to strive for excellence. It's okay to strive to be better. It's okay to learn from others, right? But to also let ourselves off the hook in such a way that we can actually love ourselves and love life. He began to integrate this teaching into his work, Permission to be Human. Now, permission to be human means simply permission to feel what you feel, permission to think what you think, permission to be a little tortured and tormented, and permission to not be perfect. Permission to be human. And we use this literally as a kind of mantra. So imagine that um, Cheryl and I are taking care of a client together at the JCC. And um, I just had a terrible session with the, like I, I just was terrible. Like sometimes, you know, we're not, we're just not on it. And I was terrible and I go to Cheryl as my supervisor and I say, oh God, I really didn't do her any, any good today. I feel awful. And Cheryl reflects back to me, can you give yourself permission to be human? In other words, can you forgive yourself? Can you let yourself off the hook a little bit, right? So what I'd love for you to do is turn to someone at your table now and have a two second conversation, two minute conversation. And the conversation I'd like you to have is, how might your day be better your day be a little better if you gave yourself a little bit more permission to be human. So just turn to somebody near you. Try, by the way, meet a new friend, not necessarily the person you came with. How might your day be better? We'll take 30 more seconds. Okay. Okay, please thank your partner. Please thank your partner. Like out loud, say thank you. All right, let's just hear a few ideas. How might our days be better if we gave ourselves a little bit more permission to be human? Just a few, what did you just share? It, the days might be a little bit more, a little longer? In a good way? <laughs> a little more fun? What else? A little bit more relaxed, yep. Yeah. You can't even imagine giving yourselves more permission to be human, right? And that happens sometimes because we are so out of practice with compassion. Permission to be human at its root is an act of self-compassion. I forgive myself for not knowing everything, for not being great at everything, for messing up sometimes, right? And what we know about resilience, here's the connection back to resilience, that in order to live in that place healthfully where we are both broken and whole at the same time is we need to be able to bring compassion to the broken places, to the not good enough places. The irony is that many of us are very good at compassion and forgiveness on behalf of others, yes? Well, we are like brilliant at that, and yet we forget to bring that back to ourselves. So I literally gave you a minute and a half, which is not a long time to explore this notion. But I do encourage you to consider what would it be like to bring just 5% more, 3% more permission to simply be the human being that you are. Rabbi Susi has said it this way, imagining the moment that we actually pass and meet the divine, that the divine would not say to us, the divine would say to us, I would not ask of you, why were you not Moses or Rebecca or Rachel or Leah? Why weren't you Gandhi or, you know? Why were you not yourself? Why did you not live the one life given you? 
And yet, in order to live that one life given us, we have to give ourselves permission for not like doing it perfectly, because that's not possible on this plane. So just a notion, it's both an idea, a theory, permission to be human, but it's also a practice. And the way we use this as a practice is literally, let's say you mess up. I yelled at my daughter. I didn't, but I often do. <laughs> I yelled at my daughter this morning. Permission to be human. And then repair, right? And then do the work of repair. Permission to be human. So we use it as a mantra, almost. Mm -hmm. Did you have a question? Yeah, I did. I, I'm looking at it from a little different um, perspective. I think sometimes I allow myself to be human, and my children, it, my husband is the one who's up, my children don't like when I'm human. Oh, your children don't like when you're human. <laughs> yeah. Well, welcome to the human race of parenting. <laughs> yes. So it's yeah. not just yeah. My relationship and with my husband and how I'm doing it, there are these others. Yes. Who. Yes, have impact. Things. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things that we know about resilience is this capacity to actually honor and respect ourselves, even when it doesn't necessarily please others. That's a very hard thing to do. So that's the. So permission to be human can also be permission to not make them, the children, perfectly happy all the time. Right? Yeah. Okay. yeah. It's hard. That it's, was a hard one. It's not easy. It's not easy. I have a 23 year old daughter who's adulting. Does anybody have one of these? <laughs> so ambivalent about becoming adults that they've made it a verb. <laughs> <laughs> and I say to her, you're going to be off the dole by this time. And so every six months, I'm taking more money back, which means you need to earn more money and you're on your. And that does not make her happy. <laughs> okay, permission. Love you, love you dearly. <laughs> permission to have your feelings, permission for me to do this in a way that I know is best for you, right? Permission. Okay. This is a second fundamental perspective in addition to Kintsukurai, is the notion of true hope or grounded optimism. One of the mistakes people make about positive psychology is they think that we're talking about being happy all the time or being delusionally optimistic like we're in a Disney film, right? This is not about unicorns and bluebirds. This is about being grounded in an optimism that actually nourishes us. And what's beautiful about this teaching of grounded optimism is that it emerged at the same time in the medical oncology world a notion of true hope became articulated. True hope versus false hope. So the notion of true hope, I'll start there, was articulated by a medical oncologist at Mass General named Jerome Groupman. He wrote a beautiful book called The Anatomy of Hope. And his question was, as a medical doctor, how do I convey very difficult news to patients and patients' families in such a way that I engender a realistic hope? Because I don't want to give them false hope, but I don't want to give them no hope either, right? And he found that as a clinician, when he was first starting out, having to offer difficult diagnoses, he was tempted to do what some of what he saw his colleagues do, which is, on the one hand, sometimes it's so uncomfortable to say bad news, right? Have you found that with the people you're taking care of, that sometimes it's really hard to say the bad thing? Yes? Um, like, okay, you really can't drive any longer. Yeah, hard, very hard, right? Very hard. Um, so sometimes physicians were making the mistake of being super harsh and just saying, okay, you have stage four brain cancer, there's nothing we can do for you, go home. Right, like that, like that. I mean, I'm, I'm exaggerating a little, but it felt, feels like that. And on the other time, physicians, on the other end, physicians were making the mistake of doing sort of the, well, it doesn't look great. We're going to do more tests. We're going to bring some people in. We need to look at more. And you feel like, what? Just tell me the diagnosis, right? And that there needed to be a way to convey difficult news and to live as a physician in the place of this constantly having to face difficult news such that it grew a realistic hope. And the model that he came up with was the exact same model that positive psychologists were noticing that resilient folk live into. And so in the model, you'll see two intersecting circles. And by the way, if you want a copy of the slide deck after, um, 
Deborah, where are you, Deborah? Deborah in the beautiful white jacket there. Do you have your email addresses? If I don't. Let her know. Give her your email. She can, she'll send the slides to you. So this notion of true hope is two intersecting circles. And you'll see on the first side, we have to face reality as it is, right? Denial works literally for about 48 hours. If you want to watch Game of Thrones again, back to back to back, 48 hours in a row, you go right ahead, right? But around the third, I'm being funny, but I'm not really. Around the third day, around the 72 hour mark is when we start to see resilient people actually activating resilient strategies, right? Because when difficult news comes, of course, we go into shock. There's a, it's like a concussion, right? And it takes about that long to really start to actually put a piece of a strategy together, usually. Some of us faster, but often there's a few days of real shock. But we need the capacity to face reality as it is and name it out loud. No, it isn't okay for you to drive any longer. Um, I'm not sure that you realize, but you, you're losing your capacity to speak. So we do need to find a way to get a speech therapist into your program, right? Um, I'm looking at you and watching. This is a, something that's happening for in my town right now with a, the guy who is the surrogate grandfather for my kids. He has, um, a, he has cancer and he's lost his capacity to speak. And so he has isolated himself in his depression. The, the cancer treatment is actually going very well, but the loss of the capacities to speak has made him profoundly depressed. And his depression, he's isolating himself, which means he's not asking for what he needs and wants, right? So my conversation with him was, yes, you cannot speak. That doesn't mean you can't communicate. And we need to build in strategies for how you're going to communicate, right? On the other uh, circle, you see the notion of moving toward a slightly better future, moving toward a slightly better future. So what Dr. Groupman found, the medical oncologist found, when he interviewed hundreds and hundreds of patients and said to them, when your physicians give you bad news and it actually engenders a sense of hope, even if it's horrible news, what have they done? And this is what they've done. They've helped the patient face reality, and then they open the door to creating a slightly better future, and the patient herself or himself gets to define what that slightly better future looks like. You'll notice in the middle a very simple but elegant word, which is the word and. This is one of the most profound positive psychology teachings and resilience building tools, the capacity to build in the end, because most of us stay stuck facing reality. We, we realize something difficult, like our beloved can no longer drive, or this person can no longer communicate, or the cancer has gotten worse, or they used to forget, you know, little things and now they're forgetting really important things like their children's names or something like that, right? And we stay stuck there. And sometimes we start to ruminate and we start to worry and we feel sad and we feel regretful. Sometimes we feel angry. We feel an sense of injustice in the world. Why is this happening to him or her? Why is this happening to me? Yes, am I? Yes? yes. And we don't know to move toward a slightly better future that we define or we help them define for themselves. So here's what this can look like. In um, 2011, my younger brother, who was 48 at the time, was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer. He lived in North Carolina. I live in the Berkshires. The very next morning after that phone call, I flew down to be with Johnny in North Carolina. And that evening, I showed him this model. I said, Johnny, he was an ER doc. Stage four cancer was everywhere. There was no pretending that shark powder or John of God or the, you know, the cancer was everywhere. We knew he was going to pass. That was not up for question. But I said to John, you get to decide what a slightly better future looks like anyway. And the next morning, I was back over there at six in the morning, he and I had tea together. And he said, I thought about that all night long and here's what I've gotten, here's what I've decided. I want you to tell everyone 
mom and dad, my wife, my colleagues, my best friends, my frat brothers. I want you to tell everybody that if you want to be on this journey with me, it's all about my kids. He had four teenagers. My slightly better future is seeing everybody help me take care of my kids. And that became the mandate for the next 10 weeks that Johnny lived. And for 10 weeks, we all bounded in his definition of a slightly better future. And what happened for me, because as the caregiver, we want to do this for ourselves as well. What does a slightly better future look like for me as my brother is dying? And I decided what that looked like for me was living into the possibility of being the best older sister I could be. That I could face his passing as it was going to kill me, and at the same time I could face it well if I knew I was doing a good job being his older sister. And so we agreed that every day, either I was going to be with him or I was going to text him, I would ask Johnny two questions. What do you need? What do you want? And I would do the best I could to make it happen. Some days I could, some days I couldn't. But every day I was in touch with my baby brother. That was my slightly better future. His was focusing on the kids. So this notion of the and can be used in profound moments. It could be also used in very ordinary mundane moments. Let's say that you're at a buffet and you're in line and you're the fourth person in line and you're starving. And the first person in line is stopping and looking at every single item on the buffet <laughs> as if they've never seen a bagel before. <laughs> and you're thinking, oh my God, is this, is it really? Like I knew what kind of bagel I liked when I was five. How do you not know what kind of bagel you like, right? So we're in our heads, we're judging, we're irritable, we're pushing, we're starting to radiate toxic fume. This is me, by the way, I'm outing myself here, <laughs> right? And what does a slightly better future look like? And in this moment, I could take a breath and be kind. And in this moment, I could make a joke about it. I could use my humor. And in this moment, I could turn to the person in front of me and say, I'm actually starving. How are you feeling about the bagel? Could you make a decision before we get there maybe? <laughs> right? Like there are a thousand small choices we could make. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to practice this now. I'd like you to invite you to bring to mind a current stressor in your life. It doesn't have to be the biggest stressor, but something that's stressing you out a little or you're a little worried about in the near future. So bring that to mind. And if you need one, you can take one of mine. <laughs> Everybody got one? Yes? Okay. Now, stressors are problematic, but what's even more problematic usually is how we think about ourselves relative to the stressor. So let's say, for example, I have a herniated disc in my back, which is true. So I'm in pain often, not always, but often. And when I herniated the disc in my back, which was a year ago, the most common frequent thought that came to me every time I felt pain was, you're an idiot, or I'm an idiot. Because I had back pain on and off for years and I ignored it. Because I think I'm 25 and clearly I'm not, right? I'm an idiot, right? We make the hard thing harder. So relative to the stressor, I'd like you to bring to mind a thought or a phrase a negative, a critical thought that you might have about yourself or you might have about the world. So it could be something like, the world's never nice to me or why do all the bad things happen to me or that person is never going to respect me or I'll never find love again or it could be you're an idiot or I'm not smart enough to figure this out, right? So just bring to mind that negative thought that you either have about yourself or the world relative to the stressor. This is the painful part, it's gonna get better, okay? Good? Okay. Now, somewhere on your little pamphlet, you have a pen. I, I want you to write down that negative thought. You don't have to share this, but I want you to write it down. And you can do it on your phone if you have a phone. And if, does anybody need a piece of paper or a pen? Can we get anybody a pen or paper? Just write down that negative thought. Oh, and you have post-its in the middle of the table. Excellent.
it's either usually a self-critical thought or you know something that upsets you about the world <laughs> just one thing honey <clears throat> okay you got your thought down yes you have to say yes people yes, yes. yes. good 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 okay over there good okay now after that thought I want you to write the word and just write the word and and on the other side of the and I'm going to challenge you to try to come up with two statements <coughs> that are slightly positive in other words they don't have to be outrageously optimistic but they move you in a positive direction and they're true meaning you believe them so for example relative to my herniated disc I'm an idiot that is a very common thought in my head I'm an idiot and I know how to have fun with this which is true and I can ask people for help more often that would be a good thing right both of those are true and I do believe them I can ask people for my help more often and I not have fun with this okay so just invite yourself to see if you can come up with one or two phrases that are slightly positive they don't have to directly fix the problem or the stressor, they're just one or two slightly positive thinking phrases. Go ahead. Well, you're, you're free to mutter. No, we're good. Okay, no chatting. Do your work. <laughs> okay. So I'd love to hear an example from someone who found this useful. Yes. And I'll, I'll repeat. So just, we don't need to know the story, just the phrase, the negative phrase. I'm sorry, say that a little louder. I don't have the courage to defend, to defend myself from family criticism, right? I don't have the courage to defend myself from family criticism and I need to get a mediator. I need a mediator. I need to ask for help. I need to get a mediator. And when you wrote that, that other phrase down and I need to get a mediator, was there a shift in experience inside yourself? Okay, and when you saw it written down, what did you experience inside yourself? Like, um, I'm sure now. You're sure. Certainty. Yes. A little more clarity. Certainty. Yes. And that's exactly what we're looking for. We're looking for a little bit more positivity or a little bit more strength, a little bit maybe serenity, right? Yes. Exactly. Just as, right? Someone, I saw someone else's hand. Was there somebody over yes. here? Yes. I keep thinking I'm going to die daily after taking care of someone who was so sick. By the way, very normal. Very normal. Right. Yep. And? <laughs> you are not crazy. That's normal. And? And? I go to the doctor and have great visits. And I'm strong. And I'm strong. I don't know why I have that. Yeah, don't worry about the why. Yeah. That's therapy. Yeah. This is just yeah. pasta. Okay. <laughs> so. See <laughs> And I am strong. So when you wrote that, or when you just said that out loud, was there any shift in internal experience for you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Give, give us a sense of what that might be, Eileen. It's almost that I'm two different people. You're two, right. I'm staying away from the other person. Right. So the other person, who is normal, by the way, when we care for someone who's died to worry that we're going to die, that's very normal. That's like the normal side of crazy town. <laughs> it's true. Um, you know, that only leads you into a downward spiral of feelings and thoughts, and then it, you lose, start to lose energy. We feel more exhausted or we become agitated, irritable sometimes. And I'm strong. It's like you've activated the other side of you, which has always been there. We just forget. We forget the other side of ourselves. Yes? So this tool, and you, you both did this beautifully, 
is, is, achieves a couple of different things. Number one, it's easy to apply. It's called a fast skill. You can do this at any time. You can do this waiting in the waiting room at the doctor's office, right? You can do this when you've just hung up the phone and you're, you're finding yourself completely, you know, distracted and agitated. You can do this at night to help yourself go to sleep right before you close your eyes. I'm thinking this, I'm feeling this, I'm worried about this, and slightly positive phrase. This does a couple of things. Number one, it increases optimism because it creates what we call cognitive flexibility. We don't stay stuck in one story. We allow the other story to emerge. Does that make sense? Like you said, the other part of me, right? And increasing cognitive flexibility not only leads to increased optimism, it also over time leads to greater confidence in oneself, greater a sense of efficacy. One of the great drains of caregiving is that we so often feel like we're not doing it well enough or quite good enough. We, 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 we're, we're too impatient or we're too irritable or we're too exhausted. You know, it's like me not quite feeding the cat every, right? Like, and then we feel horrible about ourselves. This leads to greater competency and efficacy, optimism, and flexibility in thinking. The and, when I learned the and to, honest to God, I wrote it in marker on my arm. I walked around all day anding myself through the day, right? I hate myself for this and. I'm worried about this and, right? I doubt that I can make this happen and. And it brings you to a place of greater inner resolve and strength and optimism. Any questions about this tool or thoughts? <coughs> yes? The, the, the and. Yeah. Doesn't necessarily have to be related to the, to the stressor. Right. Yeah. And, and you're not even trying to solve for the stressor, right? So when my brother was dying, it was my heart is going to break. I was literally, I had the thought that my heart was going to shatter. Like I, as an organ, like I wasn't going to survive this, right? My heart is going to break. And I can learn to love life again anyway. That was one of the things that I wrote. And I, I thought, well, that ha my heart might still break while I'm learning. It's okay, right? It just brought me to a slightly better place. It's to open up your mind to remember that you have access to more optimistic thinking, more soothing thinking, more strengthening thinking. Yeah. Great. We know that resilient people are brilliant at savoring. Brilliant at savoring. How many of you have heard of or know of Viktor Frankl? Right, Holocaust survivor in the concentration camps, three different camps for a number of years, lost everyone in his family, I believe, except a sister. And um, when you read his uh, stories, he was brilliant at taking advantage of the one good thing that happened during the day and holding on to that. Like once in a while, a stranger would throw food over the fence, or one day the guard didn't beat him, right? Or um, someone said something kind to him, like just like it's, it's nourishment. Resilient folks savor the good. So let's just make this real. This is an exercise I call the swamp and the pond. I'd love for you to just, let's just gather the kinds of things that make our ordinary Tuesdays and Wednesdays stressful. Like what kinds of things make your regular days stressful? Junk that needs to be done. No, a lack of freedom. Negative comments from the, from the person I'm caregiving. Negative comments from the person I'm caregiving from. I heard rushing. What else? What else makes our days stressful? Fear of coming back and finding him still in pajamas. Coming back and finding him, finding him still in pajamas, right? I heard something over here. Fear of injury. Fear of injury. Yep. So, and, and other kinds of fear also. What else? Constant demands of the person being cared for. What else? Thinking of all the things I have to do. Thinking of everything I have to do. Yep. What else? Physical labor. Labor, physical labor. Yeah. Uh, eating habits that really upset me. Eating habits that upset you. Yep. Rachel, did you want to say something? 
No. What what else makes our days stressful? Just regular no. days, like traffic and uh, weather. Weather. Children. Yes, children. If it's just going to go like this forever. It's going to go on forever, right? No, I was just sort of the same thing. The unknown. The unknown. Internet not working, or internet working. Yeah. What else? Not sleeping at night. Not sleeping at night. Climate change. Climate change. Politics. Pain. Physical pain. Anybody else in physical pain like me? Just me. Yeah. A few of us. Yep. How about one or two more? Can't find your cell phone. The Jewish holidays coming up. Yeah. I converted to Judaism a number of years ago, and one of the things I didn't factor in <laughs> was that if you come from a non-Jewish Sicilian family and you're in a very close Jewish family, you have to do every holiday. <laughs> Why did not anybody tell me that? Uh, oh, I'm working on the end. Yeah. And I'm thinking of becoming a Buddhist because they don't have these holidays. Okay. Right. Right, okay, so ordinary stressors, the news, traffic, can't find the cell phone, the internet, I'm in, I have a little bit of pain, and then, you know, criticism, not, not getting positive response back, there's too much to do, you know, it didn't go well this morning, all of that. that we call that the swamp. Every day has a swamp. Every day. Every day has a little swamp. Yes? Fair enough? Okay. Now, same Tuesday, same Wednesday. Tell me the things that ordinary days make the days worth living. Getting up in the morning. A good phone call. A good phone call. Laughing. Laughter. A chi a children speaking to a friend. Friends visiting. Friends visiting. Going, to the gym. Going to the gym. Spending time with a grandchild. Coffee. Coffee. <laughs> what else? The weather being nice. The weather being nice. How about that back table over there? Somebody give me something. Something that makes a day worth appreciating. Good health over here. How about something else? Somebody who hasn't said something yet. Being alive. Being alive. Going for a walk. Going for a walk. Okay, great. So, right? Every day, we call this the pond. Every day has a pond. Every day has a pond. Every day has a swamp. I'll say that again. Every day has a pond. Every day has a swamp. Resilient folk focus on the pond. We manage for the swamp. We don't deny it. We do what we can to fix it. But we spend time and energy every day savoring the good. Savoring the good. So I want to give you an exercise that will help you do that. This is hell, and if you, can we turn the light off because I want you to see how beautiful he is, right? This is what it's like to focus on the swamp only. We become this inside of ourselves, yes? And we experience life as if life were full with this, this monster, right? If we only focus on the swamp, this is what happens to us as caregivers. We become depressed, we become drained, we become sometimes mean. I do um, quite a bit of work with people living with those diagnosed with Parkinson's. And that is a, a journey of, mo of many moments of irritation often, yes. Is anybody in that place in this room or in your client population? And, and if we don't learn to focus on the pond, this is what starts to happen. We see ourselves this way and we see the world this way. So what is a practice that enables us to build in the and and savor the pond and bring us a little bit more to this experience of living, the kind of Monet sunset experience, right? So the tool I'd like to teach you is best moment of the day. So can we put the lights up for a sec? I love that you're doing the lights. Thank you. Thank you. So best moment of the day is simply this. You get ready to go to sleep at night, brush your teeth and floss people, I have a 20-year-old who's just won't floss. I'm like, okay, you're going to lose all your teeth. Fine. That's fine. You go right ahead. Do you see what I do? 
children. Okay, so you get into bed, and just before you close your eyes, you ask yourself, what was the best moment today? And then you savor it. So let's just take a sampling. I'd like you to turn to uh, the whole table. You're gonna have like one minute to do this. So you go around really quickly. Everybody share your best moment of the day. The person with the longest hair goes first. So figure out who that is at the table, and then just go around. Best moment of the day by 11, 12. Okay, you have 30 more seconds. Make sure everybody shared 30 more seconds. Okay. Do me a favor, thank the people at your table, like literally out loud, thank you. Okay, I'd love to hear, let's just hear a couple. Best moments. I heard coffee over here. Shh. So seeing the room filled, working hard, seeing the room filled, yep. Yeah. Excellent. I heard a few ahs at a table. What was the ah thing? Rocking, our kids to sleep. Rocking your kids to sleep. Putting my aunt to bed. Putting your aunt to bed. Other best moments? Spending time with your wife. You're here with your wife. <laughs> Having kids hug me. Children's school hug me. What else? Waking up holding your wife's hand. Aww. Okay, one more. One more. How about Bernie? What was, what's been your best moment of the day so far? Hearing from my daughter every single morning. Hearing, hearing from your daughter every single morning. And your other children. You are better people than I am. I just want to say that. Right? Okay. So notice. Notice the variety, holding hands, getting a phone call, hearing from people who love us, putting someone to bed. Um, I heard coffee, probably dessert for some people, right? Okay, here's how you use this as a tool. Every night for 30 nights, just one month, I invite you, before you close your eyes, to just say to yourself, what was the best moment today? And you just savor it. You don't even have to write it down. You just savor it. One or two minutes. Bring yourself back there and remember, what did that coffee actually taste like and smell like and feel like? Right? What did it actually feel? Where are you? Dan, to hold my wife's hand. Right? You just savor it in your head and in your heart. If you were to do this 30 nights in a row, here's what you would discover. Number one. Number one, you would discover that every day, no matter how dark the day, has a best moment. Every day, no matter how dark the day, has a best moment. The day my brother died, there was a best moment. The day I was divorced, after a very long marriage, there was a best moment. The day I herniated my disc, there was a best moment. Every day has a best moment, number one. Number two, because you're doing this 30 nights in a row, it's kind of like homework, right? And what happens when we have homework is we're in the day thinking, oh, I gotta do my homework. So we're actually in the day looking for best moments. Guess what happens when you look for them? You actually see them. But more important than actually seeing them, because we do tend to see nice things, we, we do, right? 
but we, hold, we don't hold on to them. They fade away. But because they're part of our homework, you'll tend to actually experience them for a little bit longer, right? And so suddenly they become significant as opposed to ordinary. They become the apple thrown over the fence at Auschwitz that actually holds you for a month. Sustenance, spiritual sustenance for a month, right? Does that make sense? So you not only see them, you see more of them, and they actually become more significant, so they, they nourish you. The third thing that'll happen 30 nights in a row is what you are doing neurochemically is building new neuronal pathways. We make new neuronal connections throughout our lifetime. And in states of savoring, what we are activating is the neurons that actually elevate optimism and appreciation, positivity, the good ones. And they also, let's say your best moment is the phone call, that particular best moment reflection will activate love and connection as well. Coffee will activate, or the blueberry muffin, or the chocolate dessert, or the fruit tart, will activate a sense of pleasure in life, which we know is important, is periodic pleasure experiences. So, neuro I'll get to you in one sec. So, neurochemically, our brain is starting to aid us in being stronger at building in the and at seeing the pond, not just the swamp. Does that make sense? So our brain is starting to help us. Yes? So may I ask you a small sure, sure. question? My apologies, let me just ignore. <laughs> Timing is everything. Everything. <laughs> so what you're saying from a scientific, I would think that there's a scientific, I would like to think that there is scientific base to what you said. Yes. And I'll rephrase it in my words. Okay. Uh, and I'm an engineer, but not in the psychology area. Basically, when you are thinking positively, simply said, your brain would get used to thinking positively and will grow whatever it is that your neurons that will make it easier to think positively and be in the positive area. Yes. Versus if you are not thinking positively and thinking negatively, your brain is learning to live in that negative area, right? Yes. And you're basically making a choice because reality is what is reality. You're not going to change it, but you can make a choice within your brain to be happy or to be miserable. Right. I would tweak that a little bit. Okay. With Because yes, yes, and I'm going to tweak that a little okay. bit. So a couple of things. You're absolutely right that the brain is plastic, meaning it can be changed. Now, this doesn't, you, you're not in a totally different brain after just 30 days. 30 days is the beginning of habit formation. What we know about learning is that new learning is solidified neurochemically somewhere closer between the four to six month time frame. So if for six months I am practicing things that activate a little bit more positivity, like building in the and, like permission to be human, like best moment of the day, closer to that six month mark, I've really, wired together the neurons that are firing in states of positivity. Does that make sense? So those neuronal connections are much stronger, which means they're much more available to me and means they are much more easily triggered. Does that make sense? So let's say, let's say you've been in a pissy mood for three weeks, legitimately. Like stuff has happened that would put you in a pissy mood legitimately for three weeks, right? And you go to Starbucks and the person in front of you pays for your cup of coffee. If you haven't strengthened the neuronal connections that know how to savor and appreciate and that see that moment as <gasps> respite, then it's just like one of these. Oh, I wonder why that happened. Do you, right? And we know those people and I have been that, per yes? yes? But if you've strengthened those connections and something good happens to you, a micro moment of positivity, you are much more likely to like actually be nourished from it actually see, oh my God, there's a pond in the day today, and I'm, I'm gonna actually spend time there. 
and you're lifted. And because you're lifted emotionally and psychologically, you are more likely, by the way, to then smile to someone else. And that person's more likely to smile to you. So now you're a little more connected in your day. Because you're a little more connected in your day, you're a little bit more playful with life. So that when the dog comes up to you, that stranger's dog, and nuzzles you on your leg, you're not like, oh my god, get that thing away from me. You're like, oh, look, there's a happy creature in the world. Yay! Maybe not in my house, but here out on the street, there's a happy creature. Right? So we create what Barbara Fredrickson calls this positive upward spiral as opposed to sinking so often down negatively. Now, having said all of that, some of us have brains. We have been born neurochemically to have brains that are actually much more easily triggered for anxiety and depression. That's just genetics. That's just a fact, right? I come from a Sicilian family. We are perfectly perfected at pessimism and rumination. I joke that if my grandmothers had had bumper stickers, they would have read, life is hell, people are crap, and God hates you. Right. Now, so, so I, so I want to honor and acknowledge that some of us have to work a little harder at orienting our brain and making these neuronal connections wire together more strongly. But there's a tremendous amount of data that with pra daily practice, and which is why I'm teaching you these what we call fast skills, because they can be applied easily any day, with daily practice, you actually do become more successful. In my 20s, I woke up every morning, and the, fr the first thing I woke up was, I hate myself, I hate my life. And I thought that was normal, because that's how we woke up in my family. Nobody was good enough. God was punishing us. The world sucked. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not exaggerating. And thank God I had a mentor who I met in graduate school who was willing to work with me to build a different brain. Where did that come from? And why was your family Oh, please. <laughs> Honey, I've done like 30 years of therapy and I don't have an answer. Yeah. I mean, in, if for some, and in some respects for good reason. And in other respects, it's because they didn't choose another way of learning and moving and growing in life. So part of what you're also suggesting, which is true, is that happiness is actually a choice. It is actually a choice. Positivity is a choice. Some of us are lucky enough to have a heart and a mind and a personality that sort of leans that way, and some of us have to do more work on it. But it is a choice, and here's what it contributes to. This is some research done by Sonia Lubomirsky in California. She did had her research team do a 20-year meta-analysis of studies that connected those of us who are generally more positive than negative. Now, this is not being happy all the time. Right? That's delusional. This is generally more positive, generally more focused on the pond than the swamp. If you are that person, you are more likely to have success at work, meaning greater accomplishment, achievement at work, greater, more likely to be promoted, greater bonuses, better peer and supervisor evaluations, number one. Number two, you have more successful relationships, colleagueships, partnerships, romantic partnerships, as well as social connections. It doesn't mean you have a thousand people loving you. It means that the relationships that are in your life are more likely to be nourishing and sustaining. Number three, there's some data, not a tremendous amount, but some that indicate those of us who lean toward positivity actually live longer with fewer visits to the doctor. We have less health issues. It doesn't mean we are illness free. It means we have less issues with our health. And psychologically, of course, this makes sense. We experience less moments of depression and anxiety if you lean toward positivity, right? So this isn't just um, trying to feel good. This is also about creating a life in which you experience more heaven within yourself and around yourself and a little less hell. Okay, yep. Uh, both. We can now look at the, ex I know nothing about DNA. I'm just going to quote you one, the little bit I know. So if there are scientists in the room who know more, please share. 
But when we look at the expression of the alleles and the telomeres of the DNA and people who practice things like mindfulness, meditation, <laughs> daily prayer, practices that orient us, by the way, to increasing optimism over time and increasing serenity, what the uh, alleles on the DNA that are expressed are different than before you began meditating. So you can actually see what's happening to which aspects of your DNA are being lit up versus those are not being lit up. It's th this amount of science is fascinating. Now, I've just shared with you as much as I know. So I'm gonna, <laughs> I don't know any more than that. Let me give you, um, <coughs> I'm gonna just show you one thing. Okay. For a moment, I would like you to just listen. Just listen and observe. Nope. I have to get the mouse somehow. Does anybody know? Oh, here we go. Mm, that's not what I want. Nope. Does anybody know how to trigger the mouse? There we go. Thank you. Well, that can be a shark. Now, my whole house is great. I can do anything good. I like my school. I like anything. I like my dad. I like my cousins. I like my aunts. I like my allies. Watching that make you feel? Can we have the lights up? A little happier. What else? Awesome. A little awesomer. Empowered. Empowered. <laughs> A little nostalgic, right? So this is how Jessica wakes up in the morning. She stands up on her bathroom mirror, and her dad was the one videotaping, and she does her little, her daily affirmations, right? I can do anything, right? I love my house. I love my hair, etc. One of the benefits of practicing these micro moments of positivity for caregivers, because there are so many days in which most of what we are paying attention to is painful, is that fair? Yep. Is that it builds in not only new neuronal connections, but it builds in the habit of looking for the thing that'll make us feel better. So over time, what we notice for caregivers is that they become better at, for example, choosing that kind of YouTube video versus watching the news. Or choosing, this is, this is another thing that we see often, is starting to become wiser about who we spend our time with and who we don't. And we start consciously choosing to spend time with people who lift us or strengthen us versus people who make it harder. Is that fair? So what we notice over time with these practices is not only does it change how we think internally, cognitive flexibility, not only does it open up a little bit more expansion in the heart, permission to be human and compassion and building in the and, which makes us feel better, we actually start to make different choices in our days. So for example, some of you, like at a JCC like this, you might have exercise classes, yes, and, and um, yoga classes, you might have art classes, you might have lectures, right? A variety of things. But we notice that people who practice these become better at saying, you know what, I can't do what I used to do because I have to be home so much, there's not a lot of freedom. But in the small amount of time I do have freedom or I'm gonna hire somebody so I have a little bit of freedom or I'm gonna ask someone for help so I have a little bit of freedom, I'm gonna do the one thing that I really love. I'm not gonna do the thing I feel like I should be doing. Like we all know we should be exercising but if you're gonna get uplift from, I don't know, paint and sip, then you make sure you go to the paint and sip class. Does that make sense? So we become wiser about how we spend the, the free time we do have. 
And this builds resilience. Is this builds resilience. Okay. I have one more thing. Yes, you had a question, Diane. Um, thinking, um, with the busy hearing and you're trying to find time, but I'll find that I'll get home, then I'll feel guilty that I'm not tending to um, my husband or my son who's living at home. So it's like you're busy and then I can give myself permission to do something. Right. But how do you drop the guilt of what's you left behind? Yeah. So guilt has made most therapists in the universe really rich. <laughs> it is a normal human experience. And if you can just hold five minutes, that's part of exactly where I'm going right now, OK? So these are, uh, we're, in the last 10 minutes we have together, I'm going to introduce to you a, a more expansive model of self-care. And you'll see how guilt weaves in. But these are the major barriers to self-care. Could you turn the light off for me? Thank you. The superhero seduction. The superhero seduction is I have to do it all. I should do it all. I should be amazing at do it all, doing it all. And even though I'm being asked to do caregiving right now, or even though my client or my patient load is bigger than it's ever been, I'm still going to do everything. Right? It's like suddenly we're all Wonder Woman or Batman. Right? That is a barrier to self-care. The martyrdom trophy hunt. This is what we're so good at in my family, to answer your question. We should suffer. It's better if you suffer more. And by the way, you're in a competition for it, and someday you'll get a trophy. Right? It literally is if, I mean, I, was, I really believed as a young woman that I would enter the gates of heaven and God would let me in if I suffered more than anybody else. That's before you became two. <laughs> True. Yeah. Yeah, Ju the Judaism thing added a whole other thing. The itty bitty shitty committee. This will get in the way. Those are the voices in your head that tell you you're not good enough. You shouldn't have taken care of yourself. This is where guilt fits in, right? Um, you're not smart enough to figure this out. Everybody else does this better than me, um, right? This is the voices in your head that, anybody have those voices in your head that torture you? Only five of us? This is an incredibly healthy community. Perfectionism. Perfectionism is, is a killer. It is an absolute killer, and it, abs it absolutely inhibits self-care. And then the victimhood raft. The whole world is against me. I'm all alone. Nobody else suffers like we suffer. My family has a giant raft out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Amazon delivers to us, up, to us there. That's how big our raft, right? So these are the barriers to self-care. Most of us have a touch of one or two of these, a touch, right? Some of us live in these places. But this is what gets in the way, right? The voices in our head, the feeling like we should be suffering. Um, feeling like life is punishing us, or God is punishing us, or life isn't fair, have to do it perfectly, some combination of those. They are the barriers. So I wanted to ask myself a number of years ago, when you are in these places and when you are caregiving, the normal ways of taking care of ourselves are not sufficient. Have you figured that out? If you were to hire, if you worked for an organization and you were hi to hire a stress reduction expert, they would come and teach to you pretty much the same stuff that has been sold since 1984. What is the self-care routine? Exercise daily, good sleep hygiene, healthy nutrition, and in the 90s we added mindfulness or meditation practice, right? And trust me, if you were to hire a stress reduction or self-care expert now, that's what they would teach you. But you can do all of those things. You can exercise even a few minutes every day, try to get yourself to bed on time, eat fairly healthfully, maybe pray or meditate a few moments every day, and still be miserable. Yes? yes? Why is that? That's the question I ask myself. Why isn't this sufficient? And what I figured out is it's not sufficient because most stress is relational. It's not really how I'm taking care of myself. It's the criticism I'm getting from others. It's the boss who's the prince of darkness. 
It's the person at home who doesn't understand how their capacities have really become compromised. And so I have that strain on top of trying to love them, on top of trying to continue to work, on top of trying, right? We have all of that. Most stress is relational. And for many of us, it isn't just the personal caregiving. It's what happens when we go visit family who have an idea about how we should be doing it differently. <laughs> who invited them into that conversation, right? <laughs> well, why don't you do this? How often have you heard that, right? Everybody has an opinion. So I wanted to come up with a model that was a little bit more expansive, but also more granular. So there are six elements to this model. The first is self-care actions. And these are actions that are nourishing to the body. This is the, the bath or five minutes of exercise on the mat in your bedroom or going for a walk, right? Actions that are nourishing for the body. These are absolutely important. It's the healthy eating, right? Actions that are nourishing. Positive self-regard is crucial to self-care, and this is treating oneself with respect. To treat myself with respect means that I often have to take a break while I'm teaching and sit down. Those of you who were here earlier saw me just sitting, right? I was sitting for quite a while to give my back rest before I stood. It's treating ourselves as if we matter. It's that piece of paper, you know, the world was created for me. And you all have an idea what it means to treat yourself with respect. It's this permission to be human, self-compassion, forgiveness and kindness, permission to not do this perfectly. Self-esteem. Building self-esteem, by the way, happens when we see ourselves doing the brave thing, meaning having the brave conversation, like I can't do this all on my own. I need to ask for help. Or like, I love you dearly, and it's time for you to go into the assisted living facility, right? Or like I said to my brother, this is not going to go well. You are going to die, and we can make this living while dying thing work for you. What is your and, Johnny? What does a slightly better future look like for you? That actually builds self-esteem. Saying no, this is crucial to self-care, setting healthy boundaries. We can't do everything we used to be able to do before the person we love became compromised. We just can't, right? And learning to set boundaries about where we spend our time, who we spend our time with, what we invest in is absolutely crucial. And then the last element is saying yes actively choosing life, like giving yourself permission to come here this morning, saying yes to life, right? Saying yes to what you love, absolutely what you love. And, and by this, I mean simple things, like I happen to love sea glass. So every summer I try to get myself to the ocean just to hunt sea glass, because it makes me happy. Do I know why? No. Do I care? No. It makes me happy. Good enough, right? right? So saying yes is a both, both about, I, want, I need to get myself to, to um, the exercise class or the gym or, or the art class that I love or the music class or ballroom dancing. It's also saying yes to ice cream and um, tiramisu and yeah, I, right? Pleasure is important in life. It's very hard to get through hard times without some taste of pleasure. But it's also about saying yes to the things that are deeply meaningful to us. Saying yes to giving yourself time to read at night or to lay out in the hammock. Right. So this is the template of self-care I'd like to leave with you with. In the last few moments we have before we close, if we could put the lights back up one last time, any questions about any of this material? Yep. Resilience. Yep. So resilience is the Yep. Resilience is the capacity to adapt 
to stress or trauma or loss healthfully, the capacity to adapt healthfully. And what I'm suggesting to you in an overarching fashion today is that health resides in the pond. It resides in the and, it resides in those best moments, and it resides in this masterful self-care template. It's as if, here's the thing, we all know that there are times in life that are easeful and times in life that are crazy making and times in life that are absolutely draining every single day, yes? And still, every day we have the choice how we're going to face the day. That is the, to use Viktor Frankl's words, the ultimate freedom. The choice in terms of how we respond to the day we've been given. We have no control over what the weather's gonna do, over how the country's gonna vote. We have no control over what other people are going to say to us usually, yes? But we do have control every single day on how we approach the day and how we approach ourselves in the day. You could feel guilty, Diane, and spend hours there torturing yourself, or you could feel guilty and say, permission to be human? I'm gonna build in an and right now. And I'm gonna set a boundary on how long I'm gonna let my kids accuse me of not being good enough, right? Yes. Yeah. That you, every morning when you wake up, you can write in the door, you say at night, writing things, three things. Yes. So what I love about, uh, first of all, this is a gratitude practice. So this is in that category of things that are gratitude practices. Um, what I love about best moment of the day is that it enables us to go to sleep with a brain that's been triggered in a positive direction, which usually helps us sleep a little better. So. Um, some people do love doing appreciations first thing in the morning. I, it never worked for me because I come from that ruministic, pessimistic family where I was certain the day was going to suck. So it's hard for me to appreciate, but to be able to reflect on it at the end of the day. Many of my students, by the way, do this on both. They do a, an appreciation in the morning and then they do best moment at the end of the day. I have students, I teach a year-long course in positive psychology, who ha are doing, have been doing best moments for almost five years. By the way, this is also a beautiful habit to do if you have young ones in your life who you love. To send them to sleep saying, just tell me two seconds, best moment of the day today. And then you reflect yours night, night. Gorgeous way to go to bed. Yep. About going to bed. If you, do you see any technique that deals with the fact that you're doing guided breathing? I have no idea about that. <laughs> like your, your, about to go to bed. You, yeah. you review the opposite right. moments. Right. You capture something yeah. that you know is very positive. Yeah. And you think about it. Yeah. And you kind of, as you fall asleep, it guides you in, into having a pleasant dream about what you thought. Okay, I'll go with that. But I, I don't know a thing about it. <laughs> Why not? Right? Uh, it's possible. I've been doing it for years. So it's, it's giving me the right. ability to solve problems when I used to work. I mean, I would prepare to think about the presentation or something that I would do the next day. Right. And it's like an extra practice. Right. So, work for me. I, I do believe that the unconscious is absolutely affected <clears throat> by what we spend our time consciously thinking about. So I'm, I just don't know anything about dream research. And there is dream research, I just don't know anything about it. Any last question, sir, Dan? I'll, I'll repeat it. By putting them to sleep. Yeah. I, but I would go in, not necessarily reading a book. I would make up a song about their day. Yeah. They did. How beautiful. When you were putting your two daughters Sometimes to sleep. I would actually fall asleep as I was <laughs> Yeah, that's, yeah. He would make up a song with, for his daughters as he was helping them go to sleep at night. Beautiful. Any other questions about the material or resilience? And do please. See Deborah with your email address if you want the slides. I'll just end with a little story then. Uh, yes, okay.
Right. Yes. So, and you're naming a phenomenon that's very common. So she's she's um, been at work all day. Children have been hugging her at school. She comes home. She sees the person she's caring for still in his pajamas, hasn't brushed his teeth. It's like he hasn't moved since eight o'clock that morning. And it. And I'm gonna I'm gonna fill this in. What what triggers for her is some negative emotion. It could be irritation. It could be frustration, disappointment. Um, sadness, right, a combination of those. And when those get triggered, those are, you know, they trigger also pessimism. And what starts to happen is cognitively, either consciously or unconsciously, we start thinking things like, this is never gonna get better, or this is gonna be a horrible night, or I don't wanna be here, right? So feelings and thoughts intertwine. And then she goes for a glass of wine. Incredibly common. The bottle of wine. The bottle of wine. <laughs> Facing reality as it is. So that was really important, right? Because we don't want to minimize how we've, we try to medicate ourselves. And by the way, trying to medicate ourselves is normal. That's human. Normal and human. That is the perfect place. You come home, you see him in pajamas. That is the perfect place to stop, take a breath, and practice the and. And... I can make a choice other than wine and I can love him anyway and I can feel my feelings and I don't have to act on them right away and I could walk back out the door and take 10 deep breaths and then decide what my next move is going to be that is exactly where we want to build in the end you see because these moments these daily ordinary moments these daily ordinary moments they're not the huge catastrophic moments. You're not coming home and finding him writhing on the floor in an epileptic seizure, right? It's not catastrophic. It's not catastrophe. But those are the moments that drain the life force from us. It's because it's day after day, or maybe it's four days out of the week. And so we do want to get better at being more facile about staying in the pond in our ordinary days because that's where we have the choice. That is exactly where we have choice. So for you, I would invite the and and also permission to be human. Permission to want the wine and maybe not choose it every night. Just permission. Permission. Very tough. Absolutely very tough. Of course. Of course. Yeah. And there are maybe healthier ways of escaping. And maybe. And maybe. I, we're a little over time. I do want to thank you for your time and your attention today. One last thing. You have sticky notes. And, oh, the gift bags on the table are for you. Please take one. The sticky notes on the center of the table. Please, everybody take a sticky note. Write down one, good, one thing you want to remember from today and put that in your bag and bring that home with you as a reminder. Please take a moment, share the post-it notes. Put one in your bag. Thank you guys so, so much. Thank you. That's great. Good. Yay. Yay, yay, yay. Oh, you. First of all, Maria, thank you so, so much for an incredible presentation. Um, I myself am feeling a little overwhelmed because I have a speech that I have to make, but there's so much in my heart that I really want to share. And so, um, first of all, I just really want to thank Aline again for making this event possible. Um, I'm Cheryl Sarnak, and I was um, asked by Susan to be the chair of the, um, this event for today. And from the beginning, we wanted to conceive it as a program that was, yes, you're a caregiver. Yes, you take care of your loved one. Yes, you do this. And you're an individual with your own needs and your own desires. And so we really wanted to come up with this concept of, but who takes care of you? And I really congratulate you that I'm sure for many of you, it wasn't easy to get out here this afternoon. So please give yourselves a round of applause. It's about the end. A very, very deep and heartfelt thank you to Judy Nahari, Director of the Senior Services here at the JCC, and Marlene Saragno, who were so generous in their support of um, offering this program. Um, I, have the I have the privilege 
of walking occasionally in the adult daycare program here at the JCC. <coughs> and oftentimes people say to me, isn't that depressing? Isn't that hard work? And the truth is it's the most joyful work because everybody who comes there is in the moment and enjoying and benefiting from the most incredibly enriched cognitive, social, social emotional, event and honestly we learn to savor the best of each day and yes everybody's demising and everybody's um, you know deteriorating cognitively but in that moment it's the best day you're ever going to have and the joy of seeing people laughing and dancing and connecting with each other hugging each other it's in the little things as maria said it's in the pond that the joy really happens. So I invite all of you, either today, if you can come down and see the program, or at other times, please you know, contact Judy and you will see what amazing facilities and uh, services there are to be able to help you in this thing. It's no secret that navigating the journey of caregiving requires enormous strength and courage. You really are the superheroes. And I'm here to tell you honestly, that you do not need to navigate this journey alone. At JFCS, we understand how you feel. We work extensively with caregivers and understand the complicated emotions and challenges that accompany caregiving of a loved one who's slipping away each and every day. JFCS is here to support you with compassionate and wraparound services for both you and your loved one. For your loved one, we provide care managers who will come to your home, assess situations, and make um, uh, recommendations for safety or accommodations. We offer private care management, sometimes called private pay or concierge service, where we provide high quality services to maximize quality of life and create peace of mind. We cover a whole range of services, including management of daily life, household, personal, or medical, and we can arrange for socialization and recreation. We provide a program called Kosher Meals on Wheels, which for some people can be a very um, huge relief in knowing that their loved ones are receiving a meal, and the reassurance that if you're remote or far away, somebody is uh, visiting your loved one once a week. We also offer individual therapy at home if it's deemed beneficial. For you, as the caregiver, we provide individual therapy for caregivers at our offices in Teaneck, Fairlawn, and Wayne. We have caregiver support groups, and we're actually looking to start a new group in the fall. And while there are many excellent um, caregiver support programs, including one here at the JCC, there is such a need that we are going to create a new one as well. Thanks to the generosity of the Wolf Caregiver Grant uh, Program, we have grants for respite so that caregivers can take a break. So please ask us about that. And again, ongoing programs and events such as the one today, where we want to give you the opportunity to have fun with other caregivers, just always remember that you cannot pour from an empty cup. And that self-care is not selfish. It is actually a necessity. And these programs are designed to help you recharge your batteries, re-energize, and give you an opportunity just to have fun. So please stay tuned for our next program, which is planned towards the end of late um, January. And please stay tuned for additional details. And it's really our fervent hope and desire that this But Who Takes Care of You will become an ongoing and integral part of the services that we provide at JFCS. So if you have any immediate questions, uh, Patty Stoll, Patty and Susan Goldstein are available. And um, Where's Susan? Oh, thank you, Susan. So the, if you have any questions, we can take those now. I just have a few things that I want to point out. First of all, on the table 
are the little stones, and I find those very helpful in my own life to be used as an anchor in those moments when things are getting crazy and frazzled. So we've provided you a gift of a, of a little stone that you can use as an anchor, so please take those with you. We also have a survey which we'd really like you to fill out because we want to know what programs do you want? What times are good for you, etc. And we will take all of that information into account when we plan additional uh, programs. Um, we also have goodie bags for you on the way out, so please be sure and take those and look through them. Thanks again to the generosity of the JCC and part of our ongoing commitment as JFCS to give you the nurturing you need. We are lucky enough to have um, chair massages outside. They're going to be able to take advantage from from 12 to 1. So please be sure if you have some time to stop by and uh, do that. Um, I want to thank you so much for coming. And um, when we, again, when we were conceiving the idea and the notion of this program, we were brainstorming different ideas. And all of a sudden, it occurred to me that I could not think of anybody more perfect for today's presentation than Maria. And I'm sure you will agree. She certainly fit the bill. So all that's left for me to do is thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. This has been a really joyous moment for me and I will savor this for a very, very long time. Thank you. Oh, wait, wait, one, la one last thing, sorry. The video, we, we haven't quite figured out how, but it will be available to you. Yes, and let me say this, that Maria, as you heard, is just superb. And if you want to bring a little bit of Maria home with you, and uh, maybe as good um, self-care, um, she does have her book available for sale today, outside, at the table. And Maria, will you sign the copies of the yes. books? Yes, okay, and I really highly encourage you because you know what, we, do? we come here, we're inspired and everything's very exciting and then we go home and then we forget. So having the book will also provide you with a very tangible anchor to be able to remember that this is a process. So thank you all for coming.